Welcome. Banner Alzheimer's Institute is dedicated to ending Alzheimer's disease without losing another generation, while setting a new standard of care for patients and their families. We have created this Planning Ahead class for families to learn how to better plan for medical, legal, social, and care needs of people with dementia. At the end of this program, we hope that caregivers will be able to do several things. First, understand the importance of planning ahead for legal, financial, and medical decisions. Second, to be aware of various options to pay for care. And finally, to learn about some helpful community resources. So why is legal and financial planning necessary? Legal and financial planning is necessary for all adults, and I always focus on that, and as people age, but it's most important for a person with Alzheimer's disease or related dementia as these diagnoses progress and will gradually affect the person's ability to make informed decisions. Planning allows the person with dementia to state their wishes about care and who will be their decision maker when they are unable to make decisions. The focus is on being proactive rather than reactive and dealing with emergencies. Generally, these are important components of getting your affairs in order. Often we avoid discussing things that make us feel uncomfortable, but an important initial planning step is getting your advanced directives in place. We know that with a progressive disease like dementia, verbal and thinking skills will deteriorate. A living will allows your person's wishes to be carried out for when that person is no longer able to articulate them. Complete advanced directives are documents that communicate healthcare wishes when a person is no longer able to make those kinds of decisions. A complete durable financial power of attorney appoints someone needed in order to handle financial and legal decisions. Whereas a complete estate planning really encompasses everything from wills, trusts, and funeral arrangements. Advanced directives can vary depending on the state where you live. In Arizona, we recognize a durable healthcare power of attorney that appoints a representative and alternates to make healthcare decisions for you. A durable mental healthcare power of attorney appoints a representative to make mental health decisions and authorizes admission to a behavioral health facility. Many people say they've never had mental health problems. They don't need to complete that portion. But we really encourage people to complete the full packet because we know that with a progressive neurological disease like dementia, often emotional and behavioral symptoms present and behavioral health treatment is needed. A living will expresses wishes about medical treatment at end of life. One family whose mother had end-stage dementia decided not to aggressively treat a newly diagnosed cancer. A pre-hospital medical care directive, a do not resuscitate or DNR, is printed on orange paper. It directs emergency personnel not to resuscitate. In the event of cardiac or respiratory arrest, it directs withholding of cardiopulmonary resuscitation or CPR by emergency medical technicians and hospital emergency staff. We recommend that you keep that in a place where emergency medical staff will see it, like on your refrigerator. A person with end-stage dementia may or may not want to be resuscitated if a cardiac event were to occur. So in getting your affairs in order, it's very important to have a primary and backup decision maker or agent. Advanced directives and durable financial power of attorney can be done independently by completing and signing those pre-printed forms. Or you might complete them with the assistance of an elder law attorney. Advanced directives can be notarized or witnessed by one non-family member. But keep in mind that a durable financial power of attorney requires notarization and to be witnessed. Each state has different laws on advanced directives. A healthcare directive prepared in another state is valid in Arizona if it was valid in the place where it was implemented as long as it doesn't conflict with current state laws. If there's more than one healthcare directive and they are inconsistent, the most recent directive is deemed to represent the wishes of the patient. Also consider that the person with dementia, if they're your agent, they may no longer be capable of acting on your behalf. 
Look for healthcare directive sample documents in your state. In Arizona, we have them located on the Arizona Attorney General Life Care Planning Packet on the website, Advanced Directives Registry through the Arizona Secretary of State. If advanced directives are not completed and the person with dementia cannot make informed decisions, Arizona law allows for a surrogate to make most healthcare decisions. Surrogates are assigned in the following order, the spouse, a majority of adult children, parent, domestic partner, and so on. Surrogates cannot remove feeding tubes or IV hydration, nor can they admit somebody to an inpatient mental health treatment facility. A guardianship or conservatorship may be needed if medical and financial powers of attorney are not in place, or if the individual is uncooperative in allowing the powers of attorney to make decisions or with significant family discord. Court procedures where a judge appoints a representative to make decisions occur. A guardian makes decisions about medical care, living arrangements, and all daily needs. It's equivalent to acting as someone's parent. A conservator solely manages finances. For example, if someone is capable of taking care of their daily needs and is cooperative, but is squandering money or being financially exploited, a conservatorship may be needed. You can file the petition paperwork with the court independently, but it is complex and typically requires the assistance of an elder law attorney, which can be quite costly. Once you've gone through the trouble to complete your advanced directives, we tend to file them away and forget about them. Make sure to share this information with family or other people that you've appointed as representatives. Provide copies of the powers of attorney and living will. Keep copies of the legal documents and important papers in one protected place. And tell the appointed representatives where these documents can be found. Consider adding health care power of attorney copies to your medical record at your primary provider's office. We can't stress enough to have planning discussions early to be able to include the person with dementia. If you need more assistance, where do you want to be? How aggressive do you want medical care to be? Be cautious in making promises that may not be able to be kept. Often caregivers, family members, promise never to place their loved one in an assisted environment. But we know that with this disease, with dementia, as it progresses, the level of care rises and keeping the person at home may not be possible, feasible, or even advisable. The safety of the person with dementia has to be the top priority. So during this section of the presentation, we're going to discuss how to pay for care. As we all hear and know, Alzheimer's disease and related dementias are very costly illnesses, and many families worry about how they're going to meet these expenses. So I'll review several different options that can help with paying for care. First though, I like to talk about Medicare, which really only covers acute care and skill care needs. So most people with Alzheimer's disease or a related dementia need assistance with personal care and supervision, which is not covered by Medicare. Medicare supplements and Advantage plans are based on Medicare coverage and also do not cover long-term care needs. Long-term care insurance is one option to help pay for care. It can be very helpful if this is in place before a diagnosis of a dementia. It's very difficult to purchase as people age and have chronic illnesses. Also, the cost significantly increases with age. When in place, it's typically activated with a diagnosis of a cognitive impairment. Services may include in-home care, adult day health care, and placement in a residential setting. As all policies are very different, it's important to be aware of what is covered in a specific policy and review it before services are needed. VA aid and attendance is another option that may be helpful for paying for long-term care needs. This is a monthly cash benefit for veterans or surviving spouses who require care on a daily basis. 
It's for veterans who have served 90 days of active duty with one day during a period of war. And most of the wars that we see people eligible for for this benefit were either World War II, the Korean conflict, or Vietnam. And be aware that the veteran did not have to be at the war site. They could have been in the service stateside or in another country, but basically it's the time frame. Financial criteria focuses on having only enough savings to pay for care for one year. One house and one vehicle are not counted as financial criteria. Payment is based on unreimbursed medical expenses compared to household income. So what does that mean? It means that if the cost of care is more than the veteran's income, then the veteran would get the entire benefit. Application can be made at the local VA regional office and be aware that it can take up to one year for a determination to be made. I always stress consider Googling aid in attendance as there are numerous veteran advocacy websites that can explain this benefit, give you helpful information, and even help you do a practice application. The last program that I'd like to discuss is Arizona Long-Term Care, or Altex. This is the long-term Medicaid program in Arizona. And please note that in Arizona, Medicaid is called ACCESS, Arizona Healthcare Cost Containment System. So coverage under Altex includes care in residential care facilities and community-based services, such as in-home care or an adult day health center. To apply, a person must be a citizen or a qualified immigrant. They must have a social security number and they must be an Arizona resident. Being an Arizona resident for all texts means that that person is in Arizona. They are an Arizona resident the first day they're here. And also be aware that there is no reciprocity between other Medicaid programs. So if a person was on a Medicaid long-term care program in another state, they have to reapply once they enter Arizona. So to qualify for this program, a person has to be financially and medically eligible, and I will go over those criteria for you. First, for all tax financial eligibility, income and resources are both considered. Income limits are usually raised every year. So very generally, a single applicant's income can be about $2,000. For couples, the applicant's income only can be considered if it's under the income limit or the couple's income is combined and divided in half. If the applicant's income is over the limit, establishing an income only or a Miller's Trust can help to resolve this. And most elder attorneys that are familiar with all tax will know how to accomplish this. So for current information on the income limits and the Miller's Trust, go to this website for the most updated information. Resources are the second area of consideration for financial eligibility. And resources include bank accounts, stocks, bonds, certificates of deposit, IRAs, the cash value of life insurance policies, and property that the applicant is not living in. Resources that are not counted include the applicant's primary residence, unless it's in a trust, one vehicle, prepaid funeral plans, $1,500 designated for a funeral, and personal belongings. So be aware that if you have very valuable paintings or jewelry, they will not count that. For a single person, it's very straightforward. The resource limit is $2,000. All funds have to be spent down to that amount. However, for a couple, there's a community spouse resource deduction that protects some of the couple's shared assets for the well spouse. And this is very important to keep in mind because some spouses feel they have to spend all their savings and have nothing left for them. And a number of years ago, the federal government put this into place to protect some of the assets for the spouse that does not need care. 
for the community spouse resource deduction, the well spouse is allowed to keep half of the couple's shared assets within certain limitations. Application for this is made when the person needs care on a daily basis. The well spouse then needs to spend the applicant's resources down to $2,000 for eligibility. And in general, again, because these figures change every year, the well spouse can generally keep between approximately $20,000 and $100,000. And again, the website noted can be very helpful in learning about this program and the current resource limits. In addition to qualifying financially for all tax, an applicant must also qualify medically. This is accomplished during a medical interview by either a nurse or a social worker called the pre-admission screen or the PASS. This reviews assistance with activities of daily living, such as bathing or dressing, medication management, mobility, safety concerns, incontinence, such as bowel or bladder accidents, having a cognitive impairment, and behavior, such as wandering or aggression. Family members must be present during this interview to provide accurate information. Most people with Alzheimer's disease have changes in judgment and understanding, so they may think they're doing things that they really aren't. We recommend that it's very, very important to prepare in advance for this interview. It's helpful to have medical records stating the current diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or related dementia. It helps to begin making a list of all the dependent needs and safety concerns and or behaviors that the applicant has exhibited, repeatedly or occasionally. The focus is on looking at the person's worst day. This is not when you want to make them look good or be, or focus on their strengths. You really want to look at their dependency needs. Uh, it's very important to be successful with this end of the uh, application. There are some other considerations that are helpful to be aware of when you're applying for Altex. The program does look five years back on transfers of funds or assets, and if that occurs, there can be a penalty at the time of eligibility. Applicants also will choose one of several Altex health plans. Once eligible, a case manager is assigned from the health plan to set up specific services that are necessary. Applications are started by calling the local county office in Maricopa County. The numbers are on the screen. If you live in another county, visit the website on the screen to obtain the number for your local office. I'd like to talk about community resources. Community resources are important to help support the family and their person with Alzheimer's disease. Service needs will be unique for each family based on the situation, family or care partner's availability, and their involvement. Some families have many local family and friends who are willing to pitch in and help with care, while other families may have little or no extended family support and may need to rely more on local resources. Community resources can assist to support the physical, emotional, and behavioral changes that occur through the course of the illness. At some point, families may have to consider a different living environment for the person with dementia. Care needs can increase and change, and the safety and care of the person with dementia is important, as is the well-being of the care partner. Community-based services like in-home care are often the first step in the continuum of care options. An in-home care attendant or a paid caregiver can provide care in the home for several hours even 24 hours. Payment sources can include things like private pay, long-term care insurance, or Medicaid long-term care funding. When hiring somebody, it's important to think about what kind of help you're really seeking so that you can clearly communicate that to the caregiver. For example, is it to spend time with your person or do you really need help with more difficult situations like bathing and grooming? Or do you need someone to help with light housekeeping assistance or even prepare some meals? Adult day health care is another type of care that's offered. 
The semantics on this one can be really important. A volunteer activity or an adult social program may go over better with your person. One center began using the term life enrichment to make their services sound more appealing. This is really a structured program that provides support as well as assistance during the day. They're designed for activities, supervision, and companionship. Care can be useful in two ways. It offers respite and social stimulation. Often the best caregivers find keeping their person stimulated with appropriate activities very challenging. So this offers a solution. Attendance can be all or part of the day or for all or part of the week. One son who was caring for his mom at home had her in adult day programming five days a week so that he could continue working. Payment sources for this program can be private pay, long-term care insurance, or the Medicaid long-term care plan. Another community-based service that can be very helpful are dementia support groups. They help boost the emotional needs of the caregiver. They also provide practical strategies for difficult situations and offer social connections. Early memory loss support groups include the person with Alzheimer's or other dementias. Those are typically offered free at various times and locations. As each person with dementia is unique, so are support groups. So if you don't feel quite right or fit into one, try another. Professional advice can be really helpful, but advice from a caregiver who's been there can be invaluable. Hospice or palliative care is really to address end-of-life care needs. Hospice provides comfort and compassionate care in the later stages of a terminal illness. In the early phase of the terminal illness, a rigorous treatment approach might be appropriate. But at the end phase of dementia, we really focus much more on the comfort care approach. The focus is on the care of the patient and their caregiver and family. Care can be provided anywhere, whether it's in the home or to supplement services of a residential care facility. And hospice services are a covered Medicare benefit and can supplement the services that are already in place. Medic Alert or the Safe Return program is offered by the Alzheimer's Association and scholarships may even be available, so check in with them. A secure bracelet with identifying personal and medical information can help with wandering. We want to put that in place before episodes of wandering occur. We want to use a proactive approach to ensure safety. We know that more than 60% of people with Alzheimer's disease will wander. It's advisable for the caregiver to also wear a bracelet. It makes it more comfortable for the person with dementia if the caregiver also wears a bracelet. In addition, if the caregiver were to be in an accident, for example, emergency personnel would know that they have a person with dementia who needs care at home. For more information on Medic Alert and the Safe Return program, please visit the website on your screen. At some point, a person with Alzheimer's disease or a related dementia may need to move into a residential care facility. Families frequently ask, when will I know when to make this decision? It's important to be aware that this is an individual decision that families must consider based on various factors. For example, if the person with a cognitive impairment is living alone, as their dementia progresses, they will not be safe to be alone and may need to move into a different living situation. The health and availability of a spouse or family caregivers also makes a big difference. If family members are working during the day and the person's alone, they may need a different setting. Additionally, many spouses that are caregivers can be frail and have their own medical illnesses that can affect their ability to care for the person as their dementia progresses. And also the amount of care that is needed can make a difference. I've had families say to me, well, when my person becomes incontinent and loses control of bowel or bladder, that's when I may think of moving them to a residential setting. So be aware that it's a very individual decision. There are several types of residential care settings that can be considered. Assisted living centers are one option. Some of the centers have memory care only, but others have progressive levels of care 
that can range from individual apartments to memory care units. Assisted living homes or private residences that can care for up to 10 people. And some skilled nursing facilities also have dementia care units. So when considering a residential care facility, I always stress that it's very important to be proactive and plan before this type of setting is needed. It's easier to plan at your leisure and visit when you have time rather than to feel pressured or when a need is imminent. So you want to visit several facilities so you can compare the care at the different settings. Make return visits. Go back unannounced. You want to ask questions. You can use the Banner Alzheimer's Institute form, which is called Questions to Ask When Visiting an Assisted Living Memory Unit, that has a number of questions that can be helpful. You want to observe the other residents. Do they look happy, content? Are they busy? Are they being occupied? Do they look well cared for? Be cautious about including the person with dementia in this planning process, as they can become anxious, resistive, or fearful. And again, as their judgment and insight is impaired, it's hard for them to make these major decisions. Sometimes a respite stay in a facility can help you to test it to see if the person would fit and to give you an idea of the care. And finally, be aware of the payment sources, especially if Altex is needed. It's important to find facilities that have an Altex contract if this would be the case. It's important to get to know the resources in your community. In the Phoenix metro area, we have the Area Agency on Aging. They have a senior helpline that can offer information and referral on lots of senior services in Maricopa County, including benefits assistance, caregiver respite options, home delivered meals, and even homemaker services. The Arizona Department of Insurance can really offer more information about insurance questions, about Medicare, supplements, Advantage plans, long-term care insurance, and even the Medicaid access and all tax plans. The Arizona Department of Transportation has a motor vehicle division where you can apply for disabled parking plates or to report concerns about driving using the driver condition behavior report. Arizona Department of Health Services offers licenses and maintain files for public viewing on all assisted living centers and skilled nursing facilities. So you may want to check that out if you're considering long-term care options. Other resources that are very important include dementia-specific resources. The National Alzheimer's Association has both a helpline and a website. They offer a lot of education, events, support, research, and caregiver information, including that Medic Alert program we discussed earlier. You can also locate local chapter and resources just by typing in your zip code. The Alzheimer's Foundation of America has a helpline, and they offer information and education specifically about Alzheimer's disease. If your person has another type of dementia, you may want to check out the Vascular Dementia website, Lewy Body Dementia Association, or the Association for Frontotemporal Degeneration. If you aren't local, you may want to check out some information about national agencies that can be helpful. The National Association of Area Agencies on Aging can help you locate the Area Agency on Aging in your community. They offer trusted sources of information in communities where people of all incomes and ages can turn for the full range of long-term support options and smooth access to public long-term support programs. The Elder Care Locator can help you look for local resources and services, check benefits, download and print information, and other helpful tools. The Administration on Aging promotes the well-being of older individuals. They provide services and programs designed to help people live independently in their own homes and communities. We want to thank you for taking the time to view our presentation. We hope this information has been useful. We invite you to review the full program again or simply sections that are most helpful to you feel free to share the presentation with others who might benefit or assist you in your planning. Please reach out for community resources in your community 
as this is a journey that requires a lot of coordination and support. For further information, take a look at our website. There isn't a harder job than caregiving, especially for somebody with a memory disorder. But we know that by planning ahead, the road can be made smoother and opportunities for crisis minimized. If you have additional questions, visit banneralz.org or contact us at BAIinfo at bannerhealth.com. And we appreciate the fact that this program was made possible by the generous support of the Banner Alzheimer's Foundation.